We hear about DNA all the time, in the news, in school, on the internet, but very little people actually know what DNA is. DNA is all around us, in your friends, your pets, and even trees. Every single living organism contains DNA. This can be explained by the fact that cells, in order to fulfill their functions, need to be given instructions in order to develop and reproduce. And this information is stored inside the cell, the cell nucleus. And more specifically, in those things which are called chromosomes, tightly cold strands of DNA around a protein. But this still begs the question, why DNA is all around us? Well, it's very simple. Cells which contain chromosomes are the basic building blocks of life and can be found in every single living organism. And each human cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes and 46 chromosomes in total. Follow me. Now let's talk about what DNA actually is. DNA is a complex structure which is composed of double helix backbone sugar strands. Even though it may seem complicated, it's very simple. It's just two strands in the shape similar to a ladder, but twisted. The rungs of the ladder are made up of alternating sugar and phosphate particles. The steps of the ladders are called bases. There are four bases, and each base pairs with the under one from the other strand. Adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. The order of the bases form a genetic code. The genetic code contains all the instructions for an organism to develop and reproduce. And this will decide whether you have curly hair, dimples, or green eyes. A segment in DNA which can determine the traits is called a gene. Genes, for example, can decide whether you have curly hair or even dimples. Let's now talk about one of the most famous scientific experiments, Gregor Mendel's pea plant experiment. Gregor Mendel, an Augustian monk, became noticing a pattern when crossing peas together. When he combined a yellow and green pea, he only got yellow seeds. This is explained by the fact that each pea receives one allele from their father and one from their mother. In this case, the seed receives one green allele from its father and one yellow allele from its mother. Yellow is a dominant trait, and green is recessive, meaning that when a pea has one yellow and one green allele from its parents, only yellow becomes visible. And this concept also applies with humans. Let's imagine Bob and Mary. Mary has two recessive alleles, blue eyes marked by lowercase letters, which came from her own parents. Bob, on the other hand, has one recessive allele, blue eyes, and one dominant allele, brown eyes. So Bob has one uppercase E and one lowercase E from his own parents. Because brown eyes is dominant over the recessive allele blue, the brown eye allele overpowers the blue eye allele, and as a result, Bob has brown eyes. With only this information, we can predict the chances of their children having brown eyes or blue eyes by using a Punnett square. Although it may seem complicated, it's very simple. You draw four boxes like so. Above the upper boxes, mark the two letters of the alleles from the mom, Mary. And on the left boxes, mark the letters of the alleles from the dad, Bob. Like before, dominant traits are marked with uppercase letters and recessive traits with lowercase letters. And now, you just have to complete it like so. We can see that their offspring has one chance out of two of having brown eyes and one chance out of two of having blue eyes. If their parents had different alleles, the outcome would be different. Although this knowledge on genetics seemed to have been known by scientists for a long time, it's actually very recent. Gregor Mendel's pea plant experiment was done a century and a half ago. Actually, the entire history of research on DNA is pretty recent. The idea of DNA was thought about in the 1860s by John Mistra. John was researching about the key components of the white blood cells which is part of our human system. He finally concluded that every living organism contains DNA. A couple of years later, Gregor Mendel realized his pea plant experiment and discovered the basics of genetics. Later, in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the double helix structure of DNA, a puzzle that many scientists attempted to solve for decades. Contrary to the events I just talked about, the next one didn't happen in a day, a month, or even a year. It happened in more than centuries. Let me explain. While some species did not evolve much for the past decades, some have completely transformed. Producers learned with time that breeding the best crops together would make better products. Let's take an example with watermelons. In the 17th century, they were significantly smaller, which much more seeds and dry. Now, thanks to breeding, we have big, juicy watermelons with much less seeds. The producers breeded their best watermelons together to make an even better watermelon. Then, they breeded this watermelon with another good watermelon, and so on, until they ended up with the watermelon you know now. But there's still something I didn't tell you. There's another way of having high quality crops in much less time than the previous way. 
like we introduce you to genetically modified organisms, GMO for short. GMO products are organisms which have been given a gene from an unrelated plant, animal, bacteria, insect, or virus. This was developed in the early 1970s and was first applied on a tomato. This tomato was given an antifreeze gene from the Arctic fish, and as a result, the tomato was resistant to frost. Since its arrival into the market, a controversy constantly surrounded GMOs. Anti-GMO movements quickly spread it across the world, claiming that it increased the chances of developing cancer and is generally less healthy than organic food. If you take a close look, you can see that those claims are rarely supported by studies. Yet GMOs are still unpopular, even though they saved entire territories. In the 1940s, a virus under the name of the papaya ring spot virus hit the American state of Hawaii. In the 1990s, the virus was present in almost every single papaya farm. The papaya ring spot virus can infect young trees and stun them, making them unable to grow healthy papayas. The virus nearly wiped out all the crops out. Even though this may not seem important, this was a major problem for Hawaii, as papaya is one of their main income after tourism. When all hope seemed to be lost, a genetically modified papaya emerged from the laboratories. This GMO product, immune to the papaya ring spot virus, saved Hawaii and hundreds of farmers. As of now, more than 90% of the papayas grown in Hawaii are GMOs, but this technology remains expensive and lengthy to use. But this probably won't be the case in the next decades. Let's go back to the history timeline. Well, there's still a major event missing the invention of CRISPR in 2012. CRISPR is a genetic editing tool, more accurate, quicker, and 99% cheaper than previous editing techniques. In addition, it allows the editing of life cells. CRISPR is known to very little people, yet it is likely that it will change everything in the next decades. CRISPR is a breakthrough in genetics, comparable to the discovery of the structure of DNA. CRISPR can remove some diseases such as herpes or HIV from living cells. This was successfully done in China, and they managed to cut half of the HIV cells from infected mice. And it doesn't end here. Cancer are cells that refuse to die and multiply independently. Currently, to treat cancers, we use chemotherapy. This technology targets all quickly multiplying cells such as cancer cells, but also hair, mouth, and stomach cells. CRISPR could specifically target the cancer cells without killing any other cells. In addition, it might even get rid of some diseases spread by insects such as Lyme, Malaria, or Zika. We could introduce a gene which makes insects unable to spread certain diseases. Thanks to gene drive, we can make this trait dominant and release it in the wild, and diseases rates would quickly drop. We already have these genetically modified insects. In this case, there are mosquitoes. But why are they still not released? Well, scientists fear that they could bring unwanted consequences because CRISPR is still relatively new. But is it justified to refuse ending the world's deadliest diseases by fear of the consequences? And if so, should we ever release those mosquitoes? I hope you now understand more about DNA, but I also hope you understand that DNA is not simply limited of deciding the color of your eyes or finding criminals with their hair. DNA is all around us, and the truth will revolve on its editing. This editing might offer the end of some diseases we still struggle to fight.